right that I focused particularly on new build, well, I, I was focusing on, in my discussion on supply, new build supply, uh, which you may think is disproportionate, which I think is the point you were making, because new build constitutes about 12% of total housing transactions a year. Uh, but there's a reason for focusing on new build is that it exercises a disproportionate influence on total supply and therefore house prices, because the majority of existing houses are occupied, they're in use, they're not just sitting it's not just owners sitting on them, they're using them for housing. So most people sell their house, then go on to buy another one. So you don't get any net increase in the housing supply. And, you know, you do get some people ex exiting owner occupation completely, which provides a net contribution to the housing, stock, housing supply. Uh, but normally that's not the bulk. And so the main source of new housing supply is from new build, hence my focus on that. Um, and the second point you raised was this kind of regional imbalance. Again, I agree, you know, one of the reasons house prices are so much higher in London and the South East than they are in the rest of the country is because of the disproportionate amount of the country's economic activity that takes place in London and the South East. However, I do want to, you know, and I'm just making this point because it's what the data says. House prices in the rest of the country are about five, six of the rest of the country. The ratio of house prices to incomes has increased at least fourfold over the last 10 years. So this is a more widespread phenomenon. If you're able to shift economic activity up to the north, it would be more balanced, but we would still have a total undersupply of housing, in my opinion. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, the point I see in this answer is more of a lot of questions that people raise. I take the point, you know, um, that there's not enough time for discussion, because there's not. I mean, and, and the reality is, we're trying to deal in this little meeting with the deluge of crap that spews out ev every day. <laughs> um, and I'd be very happy to come back another time and be in the audience and ask questions when someone else speaks, because this is, uh, this is not going to go away anytime um, soon. On, on the issue of immigration, one of the things I think we need to get in proportion is scale. So if someone moves from the furthest eastern corner of the European Union to London, let's say, or to Aberdeen, they are making a far smaller journey um, and often actually with fewer cultural and linguistic barriers than some, than some people do when they move within India or they move within China or they move within Brazil or actually even within the United States, well, the cultural values are really not great there. I.e., from, the, from a strictly economic perspective, it makes no difference whatsoever whether you're, uh, you come from Birmingham to London or Bratislava. The, 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 the point about the whipping up of racism and, and non-systematic immigration is to pretend that there's a difference, that they're taking our jobs, well, actually, if they create our jobs, you know, immigrants to this country um, create about um, one in seven of all the new jobs that are created, even though they are only about one in 14 of the population. So, you know, it's, it's immigration is a positive. And actually, one of the ways you can tell is all the reactionary, militaristic and authoritarian regimes in history, going all the way back to um, feudalism, but all the way up to the modern era, like you know, the junctures that used to exist in half of southern Europe, they all restrict the right for freedom to move. Because that doesn't, not because they all support the working class or the peasantry, it's because they <laughs> that's a benefit to the owners of capital, the owners of land. They want to restrict our ability to move. And people in this country sometimes talk about it as if no one moves except to Britain. <laughs> in fact, Britain has, of, of its level of GDP, has a lower level of immigration than most other countries in Europe. And actually, Britain still actually work, live and work abroad as well. So, you know, if you restrict the freedom of movement of labour, is what people are talking about, let's be clear, that means your opportunity as a bricklayer, 
and an IT specialist or whatever is limited, you won't be able to go abroad. Um, so I think we should be, be, be clear on that. Um, the situation is not a catastrophe. It's very, very bad, and it's m much worse than we're used to in this country. But compared to what's happened in other countries, the situation in Britain is not desperately bad. And actually, they will be able to make up the shortfall. There'll be a big song and dance and a big hoo-ha about it from the Tories and the Tory press, when actually in either the next three months or the three months after, GDP will go above it where it was in 2008. So it's not true that, that they can't get out of this crisis. They can get out of this crisis. We're not getting out of this crisis. That's, that's, the, um, um, that's the point. Well, can the economy grow without leeching on the rest of the world? Well, yes, it can, because it's gone from minus 7% from where it was to back to close to zero, and it will go up a bit. You know, opponents of austerity don't argue, or sensible opponents of austerity, don't argue that this can never change. It is changing. There will be um, recorded growth in GDP. It just won't benefit us. Um, that's the whole point. That's how austerity works. Um, so, yes, the economy can grow. Um, and it will grow. It is growing. It eventually will recover. It hasn't recovered yet. Um, but it, it won't be a recovery for us. And that's, that's, that's how austerity works. Are there countries in the world where things are done much better? Thankfully, yes. Um, it's actually, it's much easier, it's much shorter list to say countries in the world which do things worse. Um, because most countries in the world have been growing much more strongly than Britain and raising living standards much more strongly than Britain for a very, very long time. And actually what's happening to some extent is the world is going back to the way it used to be before um, Britain colonised the rest of the world. And actually people in this country complain about it. So China and India are a threat. But actually we robbed and plundered those countries for a long time. And that, because we can't do it anymore in the direct way we can, they are now growing. I mean, in the, in the hundred years um, before 1960, the Chinese economy didn't grow at all, and it was zero. Uh, and that was mostly under British and other um, foreign imperial rule. Um, and it's grown enormously since. But suddenly that's supposed to be a problem. Similarly with India. In India hardly grew at all under British rule. Uh, same as Ireland, whatever you know, have a long list. As soon as they got rid of British and other rule, then they were allowed to grow, and then suddenly this is a problem. So, yes, there are loads of countries in the world where um, things are done differently. The most important factor that they have is that they, the most successful countries are the ones where they organise economic policy around the needs of the entire economy. The needs of the entire economy are about the people in the economy. To the extent they do that, they're much more successful in, um, than in the, the recent case in Britain. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.